tonight as we <clears throat> finished last week the book, uh, the topical series Truth Matters, we dive back into a book tonight, and so I'm looking forward to our next few weeks and months as we walk through this letter that Paul would write to the church at Philippi. So tonight, if you have your, <clears throat> you have your notes in front of you, and because there's no PowerPoint, <clears throat> I gave you all the notes so you can take them home. Everybody said, thank you, Brother Jeff. You're welcome. I'm, I don't know who told y'all to say that. But on the back, you'll also see there's a, a very simple outline of the book, and then also there's a map of Paul's second missionary journey, so that way you can kind of understand kind of some of these places and kind of see where Philippi is, so... You can, you can reference that uh, tonight and also throughout the coming weeks. And also some ask, well, why don't you give us this outline, Brother Jeff? I mean, what's the point of this? Because my prayer is, is as we walk through these books, that you already know the book we're studying. And so my prayer is that as you go home in your private prayer time, your, your personal Bible study, that hopefully sometime during the week you might just at least read a a few verses or, or a chapter from this book, and you can use that outline to help you kind of see how the book flows. Um, again, that's my prayer, and that's my passion is for us to kind of dive into this book together. That being said, if you have your swords, turn to the book of Philippians in your New Testament. Philippians chapter 1. It's right there in the middle of Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. When you're there, just say amen. That seems to be the majority. Here we go. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. In the opening words of this letter, Paul identifies his authorship, his message, and his reason for writing. As we look at this book, the first thing we see is the background of the book. And like I have told you, and you, if you've forgotten, then I'll just kind of remind you, but the thing is, any time you read scripture, you need to know the context. If you know the context, it makes the book, it, it, it truly makes it come alive, but you understand more what's going on. So that's why I take the time to do this, not to bore you or to put you to sleep, but that when you leave here and you're reading next week, you understand what is taking place when you come to chapter 2 or chapter 3 or chapter 4. This book, the 11th book of the New Testament, who wrote the book of Philippians, somebody? Paul. Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, the first church, he is, in fact, this is the first church he established in Europe, written around A.D. 61. All of us would agree that Paul is the author. We see that in the very first words he says, Paul. The book of Philippi is considered one of Paul's Prison epistles, does, it, do, does anybody know the other three? Ephesians is one. Uh -uh. Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. And Philemon. Written during Paul's first Roman imprisonment, somewhere around 80 to 62. And in spite of all the negative circumstances from which Paul wrote, Philippians is a warm, personal, positive letter. That sounds interesting. Writing a positive letter from prison. Paul wrote to thank the church for a gift it had recently sent to Paul in prison and to inform them of his circumstance and of Timothy's and Epaphroditus' travel plans. The underlying theme that holds this letter together is a call for unity in the church. So let me provide a brief description of what is taking place during the time of writing. 
In New Testament times, Philippi was known primarily as the site of one of the most famous events in all of Roman history. After the battle, Philippi became a Roman colony. And in ancient times, the site was a gold mining area. After 400 B.C., Philip II of Macedon seized the mines, fortified the city, and named it for himself. If you have your copy of God's Word, and I hope your Bible is still out, turn to me to Acts chapter 16. And I want us to just keep your finger in Philippians. We'll come back in just a second. I want you to see this. And I'm sure I probably told you, but if I haven't told you, you know, there are places that you can go. And you can go anywhere from there. I think about international airports. I think about if I go to Atlanta. The first time I flew, I could... I flew from Memphis, got on an airplane, flew to Moscow, Russia. I've been to Atlanta and got on a plane and flew to Florida. These big international airports, you can just, you can get there and go so many places. That is the book of Acts in the, in the New Testament. You read the book of Acts, you can go so many places just from the book of Acts alone. You can literally embark on all three of Paul's missionary journeys. You can go to each one of those cities. And the book of Acts gives us such a wonderful picture. And, of course, Acts chapter 16, if you want to just kind of write this down, this is really where Dr. Luke pins Paul's second missionary journey, describes for us the events that transpire in the city of, Phil on the city of Philippi. We know that Paul first visited Philippi on his second missionary journey in response to the Macedonian visit. We know that to be the Macedonian call. We see that in Acts chapter 16, verse 9. They and his companion sailed from Troas across the Aegean Sea to Neapolis on the eastern shore of Macedonia. Acts chapter 16, verse 11. Then they journeyed a few miles inland to Philippi, a Roman colony with a leading city of that district is, is Macedonia. Acts chapter 16, verse 12. Now, while they're there, on the Sabbath day, they went to prayer meeting. But there's an irony here, because if you look in verse 13 of chapter 16, notice what it says. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking. And if, and if you're marking your Bibles, I want you to highlight something. This is a unique word. It's the word women. It's the word women. You say, why, Brother Jeff? What, what's the importance of that? Women are not mentioned often to be assembled together. This is something that, that is often not mentioned in Scripture. And so the fact is, they go down to the riverbank because if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, anytime Paul entered a city for the first time, he always went to the synagogue first to pray. But because Acts tells us that they went to the riverbank would imply to us more than likely that in fact there was not a synagogue for them to meet to pray at. And in fact, we know here that the Roman character of this city is apparent from Paul's other experiences in Philippi. We know that while they're down by the river, he meets a lady by the name of Lydia. Lydia is a dyer of purple cloths. In fact, we know that Lydia makes a profession of faith and trusts Christ. We also know that there is a slave girl who is whose owners charge the Jews because they troubled the city because the slave girl was mocking Paul, making fun of her, causing a ruckus. In fact, she was following Paul and would say, don't believe this guy, this guy's a heretic, he's a liar, don't believe him. And so Paul, filled with Holy Spirit-inspired indignation, long about Verses 18, actually verse 18. So Paul, at that moment, cast the spirit out of the, out of the young girl. Because he cast the spirit out, it causes an uproar in the city. Paul and Silas are then thrown in jail. The crowd rises up against them. They're beat with rods. They're thrown into jail. And then, of course, we come to that famous passage, the last part of chapter 16, where Paul and Silas are in the jail they're praying, and, they're praying and worshiping God. The Roman, the, the Philippian jailer hears them, asks the question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so you see here, Acts chapter 16 really is that, that total account 
of, of Paul and Philippi. And then, of course, we have the letter that would follow uh, from that. We know that they are, overall, they're released from prison. And so we see here in this letter, if you turn back to, to Philippians now, Paul and Timothy, bond servants. Now, if you read that word bond servant, that, that's a word we think, what does it mean? It, it, it's the Greek word doulos. It means slave. It means someone that is committed to their master. Someone that has committed a lifelong commitment to their master. And he says of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. And he includes a certain group of people. To the overseer and deacons. Now that word overseer is the Greek word episkopos. It is a leader who watches over and deacons. A person in the office of a deacon who cares for the needs and livelihood of an assembly of believers. Now, what does all that mean in layman's terms? What Paul is saying here is he's writing this letter to every person in the church. That's what he's saying. He's writing to the leaders. He's writing to everyone in the church. No one in this letter is excluded from this letter. And so that gives you a little bit of the background. Y'all still doing good out there? This means yes. This means no. Okay. Let's look now at Paul's beginning remarks. And in this passage, in this, in this set alone, it really breaks up nicely. So we'll cover the first part tonight, pick up the second part next week. Y'all good with that? Good, that's what we're going to do anyway. Look, if, look in verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The specific greeting, grace and peace, adds to the regular epistolary introduction. If you've read, and I hope that you have, you can, and, and I know I've said this, but you can read certain writings in the New Testament, and you know who's writing them. You just know immediately who's pinning it because you know the, the verbiage, you know the wordage, you know how they speak. I mean, if my phone rings without caller ID, I can tell by the sound of the voice who's calling. And I can tell by the sound of the voice if something's wrong or not. If my wife calls four or five times, I think probably the house is on fire or something's seriously wrong. If my daughter calls four or five times, it's because she really doesn't need something. I just didn't answer the first three times. But you know that as Paul's writing, it's not uncommon to see words of grace and peace since grace always reminded Paul of God's grace in Christ. This word undoubtedly conveys a full Christian meaning. And, and again, if you know Paul and you've studied Paul and you understand Paul's life, this is really bothering me. If you've studied Paul's life, you know that he would write in the first letter to Timothy, I thank my God who has called me into the ministry because the fact of I was not worthy. I was an insolent man. In fact, Paul would say in that passage of the sinners, I'm chief. If you, if you open up Webster's Dictionary and, and you thumb through and you find the word sinner, what Paul's saying is you'd immediately see my face. If you wanted a true example of what a sinner was, I'll be the first to stand guilty as charged. I'm a chief of sinners. There's no greater sinner than me. And so Paul is very familiar with the grace of God. And it says very clearly that may God's grace be with you. The fact that Paul placed it before peace may indicate further his theological orientation that grace provided for and secured peace. Peace undoubtedly conveyed Paul's Hebrew background. You know that Paul was a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin. Very familiar with Hebrew law. Very familiar with the Hebrew scriptures. And so again, he could draw from the word peace. He could offer that typical Hebrew greeting or peace of shalom, which means peace. He had the full sense of may all things be well with you. Both words as Paul has used them imply a petition and a greeting. Grace and peace come jointly from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That God sends them to believers was no surprise to anyone. Many prayed for this. 
And he also says very clearly, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The church knew well that grace was embodied in Jesus and peace was his gift to the believer. And so combining the work of God and Jesus, Paul reflected his deep conviction about the deity of Jesus. Jesus does what God the Father does. But I want you to take a notice at verse 3. If you were to attach a key verse to the book of Philippians, one of those key verses is verse 3. Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. The epistle, begin, epistle proper begins, like many of Paul's epistles, with the praise to God for the church and a specific petition on its behalf. Again, as Paul is writing this, he's writing the book of Philippians, and he comes to verse 3, and he's writing this book as a thank you letter. Imagine that. I'm writing a thank you letter. And I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Paul is describing the idea of thanksgiving. He's describing the idea of the impact that this church had made on his life. In fact, if we know very clearly as Paul is offering this thanksgiving, very clearly we know first and foremost that Paul was thankful for them, even though a problem of disunity threatened the fellowship of the congregation, we'll see in a few weeks, he lived his life in response to the love of Christ, hoping to reach people everywhere. The validation of his ministry, which was his life, was that people actually responded to the gospel he preached and remained true to their faith. Paul's thankfulness never wavered. It was every time I remember you. Do you have those people that just have a special place in your heart? And every time you think about them, you think, God, I'm just so thankful that that person was, was, has been a part of my life or, or maybe it's someone that's going on with the Lord now. And you just look back and think, God, I'm so thankful that that person was a part of my life. I'm so thankful for that person who poured into me, has been a blessing to me. I had that experience last week. I had a chance to call the man that was my pastor growing up, uh, a man that I still this day talk to quite often. And I had one of those moments where I thought about Doc. And I thought about growing up, and I called and said, hey, I just want to tell you, I took a page from your book, and he just laughed, and we talked about memories and the blessings that he was to me as a young pastor, and even now where he's no longer my pastor, but has really become more of a friend and someone that just means the world to, to me. The, and I think about Paul, and Paul tells this church that I'm just... I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. If you don't think about the Philippian church, one of the, one of the reasons that Paul is so thankful for them is this church funded the bulk of his ministry. This church provided large financial contributions to Paul. And what Paul's saying is, is that I'm thankful that God, provide, that God used you to provide for me that I can do what God has called me to do, that I can continue to preach the gospel, that I, can, that I can continue to press on. And he consistently stresses the, the consistency of his memories. And Paul, in fact, turned each thought of them into praise. What kind of a church produced those memories? They had shared hard times which served to deepen their friendship. And so Paul says very clearly because of fact in verse 3, Every time I remember you, and so if you're marking your Bibles, if you want to draw a little arrow from three down to four and five, those follow, and so Paul is thankful to them, and he says, here's what happens. Because I'm thankful for you, I always offer prayer with joy 
in my every prayer for you all. The first characteristic of Paul's thanksgiving for them was that it was joyful. The Greek text stresses the balance by placing the words with joy before the words, I always pray. What a word, what a statement. This is the first reference to joy, a major theme in the epistle. Now, by the way, what is joy? And it's not the dishwashing detergent. What is joy? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Close. It's more than happiness. And here's why. Because so often, and, and, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not chastising you or rebuking you, because we think of joy and happiness. But here's the difference. Happiness is always contingent upon circumstances. You, you, ever gone to the, you ever gone to the drive-thru and you place your order and you get your food and you get home and you're missing something? Now that never happens at Chick-fil-A, by the way, because you know the Christian chicken has got it all figured out, apparently. But at McDonald's is a different story. Or you pull up at McDonald's and like, man, I want some ice cream and the ice cream machine's broke. Or you go to a restaurant and you order coffee and they say, all we have is decaf. Those don't make us happy. But church, joy is not contingent upon circumstances. Joy is contingent upon your relationship with Christ. So because of your walk with Christ, no matter what happens around you, you can still have joy. And happiness, we all have bad days. Y'all know me. Y'all know that my absolute least favorite day of the week is Monday. My favorite day of the week is Sunday. But Paul says, I always pray. And Paul informed his readers with this, with this thanksgiving was actually done in prayers. Therefore, the sense of thanksgiving was resumed in two words for prayer. So every time I pray. Now, some of you might go, now, Brother Jeff, did Paul pray for the Philippian church every day? I don't think so. But I do think this. I do think that every time Paul got word or somehow correspondence or, or somehow the thought reached his mind of this church, I think Paul smiled. I think Paul sat back and thought, man, what a great church. And then he stopped for a moment and said, God, I just want to thank you for that church. I want, I want to pray that you continue to use them for your glory and your honor. I want you to protect them, keep them safe. Place a hedge around their fellowship. And so, do I think that Paul prayed every single second? No. But do I think when those moments took place? Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, as Paul says, always offering prayer with joy in every prayer for you all. And he says on in verse 5, in view of your participation in the gospel... From the first day until now. He, his thoughts move on to express the ground of his thanksgiving. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Now I notice that when you see that word participation, it's a unique word. It is actually the Greek word koinonia where we get our word fellowship from. Now, alright, I'm talking to Baptists. This is not what we as Baptists call fellowship. This was not a, everybody bring a covered dish. Nobody had fried chicken. Nobody had banana pudding. Now please hear me, that does make fellowship, but this is not what Paul is talking about here. But he says the fellowship or the participation. It's the activities or privileges of an intimate association. The fellowship in what some ask, the fellowship in the gospel, the participation in the gospel, the euangelion, the good news. Please hear me, if you don't learn anything else tonight, learn this, the gospel is good news. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is the greatest news any of us have ever heard. 
that there was a God that loved us. There was a God that put his son on the cross for us. That by Jesus Christ's sacrificial, atoning death, my sins can be forgiven. I can be cleansed. I can be made new, not by what I've done, not by anything I can deserve or earn, but simply by what he did for me. And if I place my faith and trust in him and accept him as my Lord and Savior, then I'm forgiven. My eternal destiny is, my eternal destiny is set when life on earth is over. I know where I'll spend eternity, and that is the greatest news anyone can ever and Paul says very clearly that your participation in the good news, and what Paul's saying is not just you sharing the gospel, but the fact that you allowed me to share the gospel. Do you realize right now that you and I have partnerships with folks all over this world that are sharing the gospel right now? Do you know that? If you don't, you do now. We have the ability to work with church planters in Las Vegas, up north, down south. We are working with in, in China, in Africa, all over the globe. You say, how is that possible? Because this thing called the cooperative program, where we do more together than we do separate. And what Paul says is the same thing, is that because of your generosity, because of your gifts, because of how you invested, the gospel is able to not just be shared in Philippi, but continues to be shared everywhere I go because of your funding and your generosity that allows me to continue to press forward by sharing the gospel. My, my mentor, Doc, when I first got into ministry, there's a few things he told me. The first thing was, Jeff, if you can do anything else and make money and be happy, do it. But he said, Jeff, if you can't do anything at all and be happy, then son, you better preach. And he also told me, he said, Jeff, remember, you don't preach for money, but you can't preach without it. I said, huh? He said, Jeff, he said, he said that car don't run on ambition. He said, you got to buy gas. And Paul says very clearly in this, that because of your generosity, that you were able to participate and to fellowship with me in the gospel from the very first day until now. And the effects that you had in sharing the gospel. The establishment of the church through the preaching of the word, again, recorded in Acts 16. They receive the gospel message and their obedience to it is shown to be genuine by the outworking of truth in their lives. They have abounded in the grace of unstinting generosity and have proved the sincerity of their love for the Lord and His work. We today might take the lesson to heart that the sign of our professed love for the gospel is a measure of sacrifice we are prepared to make in order to help in its progress. Let me read that one more time. We today might take lesson to heart that the sign of our professed love for the gospel is the measure of sacrifice we are prepared to make in order to help in its progress. We rejoice that we have come to know the Savior and what are we doing to make him known to others? And Paul would say very emphatically right here that the gospel was able to spread and the gospel was able to impact many lives because of this church, because of this body of believers that poured into his life Yes, it was financial. I would step out on a limb to say that it was not only financial, there was prayerful support as well. And by that support, Paul was able to minister and to do all that he could do. And because of their fellowship. Again, fellowship is sweet. You don't know this, or maybe you do, 
but I have a habit. It's a fun habit. I love to people watch. When Corey and I were expecting Cohen, we spent two weeks in Anapartum where we were trying to keep him in. And if you have met my son, if you haven't, you realize that from 20 weeks, he, was, he has not stopped moving yet. And one of those weeks, our room, because we were stuck in that room during COVID, we couldn't really go nowhere. We got a room that faced outside. And it faced the emergency room entrance. And so we would just sit there and watch folks come in and out. You'd watch, we'd, we'd watch someone walk and think, yep. She's going to be here for a couple days because you could tell she was, as the Bible says, she was with child. Especially when a full moon happened. That we, we saw a lot of folks that night. But I love the people watch. But there's something I've noticed about you as a church, and I don't think you've ever noticed it. With a true symbol of fellowship in a church is how you interact before and after service. When you're standing around talking and conversing, that is a beautiful sign of fellowship. When you walk in and you're hugging necks and you're talking and you're laughing, that is a beautiful sign of fellowship. And Paul says, yes, Philippian church, you had a beautiful spirit of fellowship, but your fellowship was even far greater because it was the investment of the fellowship in the gospel. And the investment in me and in my life and in my ministry. And you were able to partner and share in the gospel, not in the gospel being spread not only here, but further because of your fellowship with the church and with myself. And so Paul would reference again verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Questions or comments? Questions or comments? All right. It's, it's sweet. All right, church, let's pray so y'all can get to get to choir practice. Father, we come before you tonight. You're a good God. Father, I, in my own life, I, I could say with Paul, I've been blessed to have been a part of some great churches. I think about my home church and the churches that I've served and and, and how special they are. But, but Father, again, the, the greatest thing I can remember is the price that you paid by putting your son on that cross to die in my place. Father, grace and peace is only through Jesus Christ. And Father, tonight I pray as we depart from here that you'd keep us safe, protect us, Father, I pray that we look forward to being back here Sunday. God, I pray for those that are not here tonight for various reasons. God, I pray for those that are traveling. Again, Father God, we just thank you for all that you've done for us. We ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.